Now, I'm sure we all love to hear directly from these very inspirational women. You know, Minister mentioned that uh, we have about 30% of our tech roles filled by women, but I'm sure we can look forward to more women joining and in even more prominent and exciting roles. So what will it be like in 2025? So in the next discussion, we're going to take a peek into the future. And leading this discussion, Mr. Frank Ku, who is responsible for LinkedIn's talent and leading, learning business, uh, is going to be leading our discussion. And LinkedIn, as you know, supports companies and technology acquisition, development and retention through its platform and solutions. So over to you, Frank. Thank you, Karen, for the introduction. And once again, congratulations to our 100 women in tech. And thank you very much for your contribution to our tech community as well as the society. So for today's panel discussion, the topic is looking at 2025, what will be different for women in tech? Now with us today, we have three very distinguished panelists. I would like to uh, introduce every one of them. So to my left, we have Professor Serene Lim. And Serene is the Associate Professor of Bioengineering in the School of Chemical and Biomedical Engineering, and as well as Associate Dean for Global Partnership in NTU. Now, Serene has been developing technologies based on bio-derived molecules, such as protein cages. Now, if this is not tech, I don't know what is tech. <laughs> and um, she has been um, nominated as the Laurel Singapore Woman in Science National Fellowship in 2003. But during that time, she also co-started POWERS, which stands for the promotion of women in engineering, research, and science. And Serene wants to identify the motivation and challenges faced by women in STEM. And her vision is to have female students, researchers, scientists, and professionals shine and create an impact on our communities. So welcome, Serene, to Thank the discussion. You, so next off, we have uh, Uma Tana. Uma is the Vice President and of Partner and Commercial Organization in Asia Pacific in Japan for VMware. And Uma is, many of us that will know, is a staunch advocate of a uh, woman in STEM. And uh, she regularly leads sessions in the industry and community. And she's also the founder of the Singapore chapter of leanin.org, which offers women inspiration and support to achieve their goals. And now leanin.org has about more than 4,000 members uh, around the world. Uma is also won the Women of the Channel Award by the CR CRN organization. And uh, she's also won the inspiring women leading the tech world by unreserved media. And thanks for joining us uh, today, Uma. Thank you. Okay. And then right at the extreme left, uh, we have Pocket, Pocket Sun. Now Pocket is a founder at Sogel Ventures. She's a venture capital investor and entrepreneur with a mission to cultivate the next generation of women founders and investors. As managing partner at Sogel Ventures, she raised 15 million for the first fund and invested in 35 women and underrepresented founders. As co-president of uh, Sogel Foundation as well, well, that's, uh, that's quite a lot of things uh, you're doing. <laughs> Pocket. She has built also a global non-profit platform supporting women and minority founders in over 50 cities. Now, Gobro, uh, Pocket also founded she VC in Singapore for women investing in tech, and it now serves more than 160 women investors across Asia. So as, as you can see, I am with a really true group of distinguished panelists, and I feel so overwhelmed right now. <laughs> and so I'm going to ask a couple of questions of the panelists. But before I do that, uh, for those of you who are in the audience, as we discuss, you may have some questions in your mind. So feel free to uh, type in on the chat and ask the questions. And at the end of our first round of discussion, we will have a Q&A session where we will take some of your questions and uh, answer them uh, by the panelists. Okay, so um, 
Thanks, ladies. I would like to um, have some exploration of um, the topic on what women in tech will be like in 2025. I'd like to start you know, with um, your vision. Right. So the question then is, what's your vision of women in tech in the next five or more years? Would women want to kick off the sure. discussion? Thanks, Frank. Uh, so five years is not very long off, is it? Um, but if I had a big, hairy, audacious goal, I'd say tech equity and so equal representation, whether it's girls at 15 to 16 deciding of whether or not they want to get into STEM to early career, mid and senior women representation across all corporates. Um, at VMware, we'd like to say there's four superpowers of tech today. You know, cloud, right, Frank? You and I could go build a supercomputer this weekend on our credit card. Um, mobility, over 60% of the world connected via mobile today. Edge IoT, the ability to bring physical and virtual worlds together. Um, and AIML, an overnight 30-year success with machine learning and artificial intelligence because we now have enough data to provide insights. And if we're going to continue to innovate, we know diversity is going to be absolutely key to that. And we know that as more women participate in tech, economic participation of women is going to increase GDPs of countries. So as I look to Singapore, where I'm born, and our goal is to continue to be a smart nation, this is absolutely going to be imperative. And so my big, hairy, audacious vision is tech equity. Right. I, I love this, tech equity. Right. And you, you touched upon a point of really getting girls into STEM as to, to build a pipeline for women in tech. So I'd like to uh, turn over to uh, Serene, since you are the the professor in NTU, you have dealt with many young ladies in tech. So what, what's your thought about having young girls going to a STEM area? So I really support that for sure. And my vision really is to increase the uh, critical mass of, uh, of uh, women in tech. Mm. And uh, to do this, we need active engagement from community, from the academia, as well as from industry. All these three sectors need to work together and collaborate to build a really supportive women in tech ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And this is why at NTU, we are starting a new program, like you mentioned, the promotion of women in engineering, research, and science. And if you take the first letter of each word of that name, you'll come up with a pretty neat uh, acronym, POWERS. And in POWERS, we aim to increase the number of enrollment of undergraduate students but in, in, uh, in College of Engineering by 5% and uh, from the current 26%. That number might seem small to you, but if we assume that or suppose that the enrollment is stable, we're talking about 20% increase of the number of female students in tech. Mm. And, um, and here's why we need to do this. Uh, Based on a study by a Society of Women Engineers, there's about more than 80% of engineers in the U.S. and perhaps the world are men. So which means that they built the world, designed the world for, by and for men. Hmm. The default human being is male. So only until 2011, seat belts have been tested for the safety on crash test dummies that are male models. So this means that they are more accurate for male. Mm -hmm. Male are heavier, taller, larger frame. So which means that if we, we get into an accident, women are more likely to get injured despite wearing a seat belt. And this is why we need to have more women to design and to engineer solutions so that things in this world work for both genders. Right. Th thank you very much. You brought a very salient point that a lot of innovation currently may not have a woman in mind. Right. And um, really to bring out women in tech, is we really need to build an ecosystem to build the awareness and community to support innovation that's related to women. Right. And I think the academia plays a ma major role. Yeah. Right. Thank you very much. And I just want to go over to our venture capitalist pocket. So what's your view and what's your vision about women in tech in the next five years? So. Venture capital is a very male-dominated industry, and this has everything to do with technology because venture capital essentially is the capital force that propels technology forward into the future. So if these decisions 
about the future of technology are all made by majority men, we all know what's going to happen. Technology will be biased um, and it won't be fair. And women creators, women makers, women entrepreneurs would not get the same access uh, and um, uh, ability to um, succeed in the future. So I think it's really important that the venture capital industry itself becomes diverse and the funding source behind the venture capital, the limited partners, including endowment funds, pension funds, uh, fund of funds, uh, high net worth individuals, they become more aware of diversity issues uh, in technology and encourage more diversity in technology. And I also think part of my vision is that um, everyone who is accessing this webinar right now, you are already a woman in tech. Um, because you are using technology to access information. You are already using a smartphone. You are already using software. So I think one mistake I made early on was not realizing that I was already a woman in tech. So I think by building this close association of yourself and technology, I think that's a big step forward uh, into the right direction. Um, and for my industry particularly, in, um, there's a new research that recently came out um, so, apparently 76% of VC firms around Southeast Asia don't have a women making any investment decisions. And for every 10 women partners at VC firms, there are 55 male partners. So I hope in the next five years we can increase that number, the ratio, to 2 to 5 at least, so that we can enable more funding going to women entrepreneurs. Thank you very much, uh, Pocket. In fact, you know, we, we had a, a very good discussion now, and while we have a vision for women to thrive in the technology scene, we realize we do have challenges. We, we do have an underrepresentation of women in tech at the moment. Right? And I'd like your point about all the audience out there. And you are, since you're assessing the, the conference using technology, you are late already. A woman or even men in tech, I know there are many, many men supporters out there in the audience as well. So, with respect to underrepresentation of uh, women in tech at the moment, I would just like to ask um, our panelists what do you see are the challenges that are preventing women from accessing the tech sector? Um, would anyone want to start? I can start. Yes. <laughs> so, I think. Um, Culture is a huge part of it. Um, I think a big challenge we face is the contentment of the status quo, uh, feeling that you know we have a great meritocracy, we have you know a great thing going on for us, and we don't need to make changes. Or Singapore is already very gender equal. I think these things will stop us from making progress moving forward. Mm -hmm. um, so I really want people to um, start thinking about when we talk about meritocracy. Um, who made the standards? What decided we think something is better than something else? What qualities are better than other qualities? Um, so I think really examine what is behind the myth of meritocracy. That is a big challenge. Um, and also, um, I think education um, is another big challenge. I think growing up in textbooks, most of the scientists, technologists, um, people that we learned about in textbooks are mostly men. And there are very few women who can get their contributions and legacy really communicated um, through history or uh, the science classes. So I think it, we need to um, increase the representation of women role models who have done extraordinary things in the past and really recognize their contribution. Right, that's excellent. Definitely mm -hmm. culture and uh, being, just being aware of women's contribution alone can make a big change. Right? What about um, Serene? What thoughts do you have you know, deal dealing with um, undergraduates, postgraduates, and researchers? What was your thought about uh, you know, you know, in the academia field about you know, the challenges for women in tech? So Pocket kind of mentioned a few of those, and then that actually resonates with what finding that the Soci Association for American Women in the academia uh, 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 studies and then uh, basically there are three things society and the university and biases conscious or unconscious and uh, society the negative stereotypes that uh, 
you know, girls are exposed to since they were growing up, really impose the self-belief they need to be excellent to, to thrive in the male-dominated field. And then you have your college universities, like we don't have enough faculty members who are female to, to foster and be role models. And then the, the conscious or unconscious bias, most people would associate science and math with male, whereas art and humanities to female. So, um, so there are challenges for every student to, to go through as they progress in their academic uh, career. And, um, and then from the uh, pre-university years to the university years and then to the placement in the industry. And once they get into the industry, they still have, again, the, the retention is another big problem. So why is it like that? And so the industry probably doesn't even have the answer to that question. Uh, so which is why research is key. And then our program uh, powers uh, really is trying to look at the reason, the motivation, what motivates the student, what demotivates the student at, every, at, at the time before they come to the university to study STEM and then to stay on. And this is part of actually having to, to recruit, to retain, and to groom them throughout their career and uh, within the supportive women in tech ecosystem. Mm. Right. Th thanks a lot. I really love you initiating this research-driven approach to truly really understanding you know, why there's still an underrepresentation of women in uh, technology, in academia, yeah. as well as in society. So th thanks so much for the contribution. Mm -hmm. And uh, Uma, what was your thought about the challenges in the uh, commercial setting? Yes, um, I look at it in three ways. Uh, firstly, you know, I recognize as a woman myself, um, there are biases that I impose on myself, and it's what I call the sticky floor. So, um, you know, when women look at job descriptions, for example, um, they tend to feel that they need to check all of the boxes before they apply. Whereas a man might look at it and go, oh, six out of 10, I'm absolutely going to rock this job. Um, and these are biases as we impose on ourselves. And that's part of the work that I do in Lean In, where we come together in circles to provide that confidence and support for each other to say, yeah, you absolutely can go for that. Um, the second is, I think, the role that managers and leaders play. And we know that most corporates today are run by men. And most managers are men today. And there's a part where men form 50% of this equation. Um, and they're also part of that challenge, hence they're part of the solution. And the way that I look at the role of men is in many dimensions. But the little things that I think men can do is around advocating for women. A very simple thing on how you introduce a woman can immediately take away a bias of what someone might perceive the value or capability of that woman is. Uh, stepping in to mentor and sponsor women is absolutely key. You know, when hashtag Me Too went live, you know, more than two years ago, men started leaning back. But if men are not coming forward to mentor and sponsor, there's only so much women can do for themselves. Uh, and lastly, organizations, you know, firstly, making a very clear leadership decision that they want to do something and making data transparent. But also, I think in my work in the last four years with Lean in Singapore, I find a lot of organizations tend to assume there isn't enough capability for women. And so this idea that you throw more training and development at women to solve this issue, I think actually there's a much bigger deeply stemmed roots in terms of what we need to acknowledge. And so I'm very passionate about the work of unconscious bias because that word unconscious itself means it's not going away. And so just being aware of it and being able to step in to do something small, I think is what everybody needs to start thinking about. Right, Thank, thanks so much. In fact, um, your sharing about unconscious bias makes me feel that I have at certain times been unconsciously biased towards uh, the, maybe the male gender. And in fact, I, I, I love your thought about you know, being conscious about how we introduce a woman. And that says a lot about how you know, we men in any organization can really support women's growth and development. And I'm so glad that uh, I'm with amongst the three of you here to support you in uh, sharing your thoughts about how we can actually support women in tech. So um, next off, you know, we have um, another more interesting uh, question, which I would like to um, ask for your personal ideas and commitments on how you personally would support 
more women in tech and make them thrive and progress well. Right? At the same time, what can the organizations that you represent do about this challenge? Anyone? I can, mm -hmm. I can take that one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so there are really three things that we can do. First, try to understand the root cause of this motivation and why they choose a certain um, majors and, 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 and when that decision becomes very important. And the second is to provide strong role, female role models in academia and, and also beyond. And also then the third one is to strengthen really the industry academia partnerships. So decisions for choosing majors typically come way before the student enroll in a university. So, but then uh, we, but so that understanding that motivation and when it comes in, when, when it becomes really important is really key. And we need to influence that decisions uh, so that they would, they would can influence the study. Uh, and, and to do that, we need strong role models. And uh, at NTU, we do try to increase the uh, number of tech professors and uh, through different types of activities, such as we are doing mentorships from the you know, senior faculty members to the younger faculty members. We are trying to develop a, uh, through the powers program, professors to students. And then lately we have been looking into bringing industry back into the academia to serve as mentors, industry mentors. And which means that we also need to have really strong industry or make, build stronger industry academia partnerships. And what we have been trying to do through powers is, uh, 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 for example, we have done Micron uh, partnered with us to actually uh, identify and acknowledge uh, the women's achievement through the awarding of um, women in engineering, science, and tech conference grant. And that's as part of their talent acquisition program that deve they develop. So we also partnered with Link, uh, Xilinx to help the first uh, all-female thematic hackathon just last year. And we have, it was such a heartwarming thing to see a room full of girls trying to start the hacking uh, <laughs> session. You know? And then uh, we are also very happy that the government has been a great partner to us. The Ministry of Education has funded, uh, is funding our powers program. And then um, it really shows our nation's commitment on building this uh, supportive ecosystem, uh, leveraging on the collaborations between academia, community, as well as the industry, all in Singapore. Well, wow. thanks. Thanks for sharing. I mean, this is so inspiring. You know, as um, to, to encourage women in tech, definitely, you know, the schools and Institute of Higher Learning is the true pipeline for this to happen. And I'm so glad to see NTU yourself personally, <laughs> as well as other institutes of higher learning, we really supporting, driving the pipeline of women into the tech industry. So, so thank you very much. Thank and you. what about anyone, Uma? Yeah, so for me personally, my commitment is in two folds. Uh, obviously, continuing the work that I do for Lean In, but very specifically, Lean In Circles. And Circles are a group of women that come together, they're groups of 8 to 12, uh, almost on a monthly basis, now all virtually because of the pandemic. And they hold each other accountable, and I say they can come together and be unapologetically ambitious. Mm -hmm. And why this is important is if I look at my own circle, um, you know, my friends will always want to tell me the things I want to hear, but not necessarily the things I need to hear. And so there is no tax on our friendship in Lean In Circles, where you help each other to think about that job you want to go for, uh, negotiate for pay, etc. And we have over 100 circles here at Lean In in Singapore, and we have more than 100 sitting in corporates. So my personal commitment is to continue to grow that. And my second personal commitment is around including men in conversations. You know, in the four years that I've done this community work, I've seen that so many men want to come forward and do something, but they don't know what to do and how to do it. Mm -hmm. And I think empathy is required from the underrepresented groups. Mm -hmm. And my role is to step in to help them get comfortable being uncomfortable. And I want to continue that piece of work. At VMware, we're doing a few things. Firstly, around pay parity. There's not good data in Singapore, but the last that I looked at it, in tech, there's over a 40% pay gap in Singapore. 
And one of the things we do at VMware is when we discuss with a candidate that we want to bring on board to the company, we never ask what their current salary is. So if you think about that over 40% pay gap, and if you're always going to use that as a baseline, women are never going to catch up. So the only discussion we have is what is their expectation based on the role that we're offering. The second that we're doing is around our new college graduates, so the young women that are coming up behind us. And one of the most interesting things that we found recently in Japan is where we've been able to move from 21% to 52% new college graduates joining VMware in Japan, which is a very challenging country to have female representation, um, is absolutely inspiring. So the future, I think, is really bright and corporations need to be able to provide the right environments for them to thrive. The other thing that VMware doing, is doing is around the use of technology. So we provide secure and simple enterprise platform that allows you to run any application on any device. That means that women are able to work anytime, anywhere. We had a large bank in India that launched this to about 70,000 users in nine months, and the chairman of the bank showed up and launched it on International Women's Day. So actually having a leader from a company say that it is okay to have flexible hours and work from any time, anywhere, is a big step forward for corporations. And lastly, bringing women back to work. We launched Project Tara in India, where we're funding up to 15,000 women to return to work. And these women had to drop off mid-career because of commitments to family and they've lost confidence and they don't have relevant skills so we're giving them the latest digital transformation skills and we're working with companies like NTT to then employ them after they graduate. So I think organizations and individuals have privilege and platform and if I've learned anything in the last four years is that everyone can do something. Right, thank, thank you so much for sharing. I'm, I'm so inspired by the work that you and your organization has done so holistically to develop this ecosystem and supporting many factors to have women really participating in the tech industry and be successful doing so. So thank you very much, Uma. Okay. And over to you, Pocket. From the uh, startup scene, how would you personally commit to supporting women in tech? So I started SoGal because I realized there was the gender disparity issue in technology, which was not something I was familiar with. Um, so I jumped into entrepreneurship because I saw this problem and I am committing all of my time and my effort to creating change. And by building a venture capital firm at the, end of, at the age of 24, I was very much an outlier and an anomaly in the industry. So in the past few years, I think maybe some people were inspired and now there are a lot more women-led funds and there are a lot more funds that are saying we're investing particularly on gender lens or we're investing, um, focusing on women. And I think that is a great progress. Um, so I want to continue to inspire more changes and also be um, open-minded to make up for the things that I haven't even seen yet. Mm -hmm. Because when I started SoGao, I thought there are not enough women in entrepreneurship and mentor capital. And the more I look into women's issues overall, I find things that I want to change everywhere. Mm -hmm. So SoGal became more than a, an organization that serves entrepreneurs and investors who are women, but also women who want to live boldly on their own terms, whether they are writers or artists or politicians or whatever they may choose. Um, so I want to continue to evolve SoGal to become a place where women can find that boldness and confidence to build a life that is inspiring for others. And I also want to continue to invest in those changes, invest in women who are creating technologies and innovations for other women. Um, and I also want to continue to provide access um, for young women around the world uh, with our chapters and our global platform um, so that they can access capital, they can access education, they can access networks and communities so that they're not alone anymore. Um, and I want to encourage more people to do the same. Right. Th thank you so much. It's uh, so inspiring to me. I, I, I really hope that uh, what you've done will be able to support not just uh, entrepreneurs or, or venture capitalists that like you mentioned, but all women who wants to live their life on their own terms. 
So thank you very much. And um, here we are. We have um, heard about you know, the challenges, the vision, as well as uh, how our panelists are individually committing to support women in tech. And uh, this is a time for us to uh, take some questions from the audience. So let's see whether we have some questions for the board. All right. Okay. So, so far, I think uh, we're having quite a good interaction down there. And um, perhaps before we, we just kick off um, the question and answer session, I, I just want to throw another question, maybe a curveball question, to, uh, to, 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 the, uh, to our panelists down here. And so what would you do if you feel that someone is saying something that disparages women <laughs> in your work environment? So I always like to go by, you know, if you are trying to step in in what I call a micro moment, that's a micro moment. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important uh, simply because I think not doing anything is the bigger crime. Mm -hmm. um, so always do it with kindness and respect, number one. And so if you're stepping in into a conversation where someone said, for example, oh, you know, someone says to Sarah, Uma really sounded aggressive, like when she was presenting that. Um, and I always like to go, oh, interesting, tell me more. Um, because sometimes people don't think before they actually say something, so you're giving them a chance to pause and think about it. Mm -hmm. And I always like to throw the question, oh, well, if Frank said the same thing, would you call him aggressive? Mm. Mm. That's right. That's good. That's good. Yeah, I, I think uh, sometimes I personally have been unconscious about saying things that actually can hurt people, whether men or women. So I, I really, I would love at that point in time to be pointed out and so that I can learn myself. Okay, now we have a couple of great questions, right? Um, perhaps I can just ask this uh, of our panelists. So how do we encourage male allies to be a part of the solution? And what are some of the things they can do to move the needle? It's something that I definitely want to hear from all of you. Yeah. Anyone? Sure, I can start. Yes, um, mm -hmm. And I mentioned some of it already earlier. Um, you know, firstly, um, I find that fathers of daughters are always the first to lean in because they are concerned about what the workplace is going to look like mm -hmm. um, for their daughters when they get there. Um, I talked about mentorship and sponsorship. Um, and if you are uncomfortable to mentor women face to face or being seen spending one on one time, have a lunch only policy or a virtual meeting only policy, but make sure you're equally doing that for both men and women so that you're not um, sidelining women differently. The second is to make sure that um, the office housework, you know, women are often asked to take notes in meetings, um, organize team outings, etc. That's what I call the office housework. Make sure it's equally rotated. Um, advocating for women, the very simple thing to do is introducing women very differently in meetings so that everybody knows why she is there and she's capable and she's absolutely qualified. Um, and I'd say for men, you know, you're 50% of the solution and if not more. Um, so stepping in on very micro moments is important. Women are more interrupted in meetings than men. Um, their ideas are more, you know, often stolen because women are judged on performance and men on potential. So if you ever see that happening in your own teams, just step in to say, oh, actually, Pocket had a really good idea earlier, and I think she mentioned that. Why don't we let her continue with that train of thought? And I always think little things like this have a ripple effect because then you step in to role model that behavior, and everybody looks at it, and everybody becomes unconsciously conscious. Mm -hmm. Right. That's uh, excellent. So I, I just want to just tease it out a bit uh, with uh, Pocket and Serene on this question. So how would you actually enable men like myself to be allies? I think, first of all, um, men should realize that this is for their own good as well. Mm -hmm. So when there's more um, equity, it's actually a better world for everyone. Because I feel that men are living under this hard armor, which can hurt them sometimes as well. And if we can all step into our power and realize that there isn't really um, you know, a fundamental difference just because we are different genders and we can both contribute to build a better society, I think that is a better world for everyone. So that is something I would 
um, uh, bring up the first. And then um, I think men who want to be allies should realize that they are the more privileged side. Because a lot of times men don't want to admit that and they don't want to recognize that they have been sitting on um, or sitting at the expense of women sometimes. And realizing that and realizing that your experience is not universal and that women um, have that women's points and women's life experiences are just as valid. So really listen and really um, tune in to what women are telling you instead of just dismissing, oh, she's emotional or, oh, she's aggressive or, um, like, we can't, you know, trust her opinion. Um, so really trusting women is important. And the third thing is if you are in a position of power, bring more women to the table at every major decision-making opportunity. Um, and not just one woman, because one woman cannot sufficiently represent the entire female population. Um, so have at least three women so that they could really have a voice at the table instead of just being kind of um, outnumbered and sidelined by the majority male in the room. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there are a lot more, but mm -hmm. I'll stop there. Right, right. Th thank you. I'll, I'll, pocket. I'll definitely take your three points that you mentioned here <laughs> to heart. <laughs> And um, so, Serene, what about yourself? I'm sure in uh, academia, there are more male faculty members than uh, women. What would you say to your male faculty members who wants to be allies? I would certainly encourage that. And I think one of the concrete things when uh, we have, for example, a faculty search committee to ensure that there is faculty nominations, which is what College of Engineering is doing, to ensure that there is women representation in the committee as well as in the list of the nominees uh, for the hire. I think that's also something that uh, the male in the academia can do. And uh, appreciating and encouraging the, uh, their peers and their women peers to, to continue uh, with their work uh, is also an important one. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right, thank you. Right, okay, so we have a very, um, well, highly popular question now here. <laughs> Let me see which is the highly popular questions. <laughs> that's a lot of questions. Oh, there's so, there are so many questions down here. Okay, so, well, this is what programs or initiative can be introduced into primary schools so that females at a young age can move into technology and start to excel in the later years before they start their careers? That is a million dollar question. <laughs> <laughs> From primary million schools. Dollar questions. Right. Your opinion, please. So, I, I would like to start that one because I think that we don't know. We don't know, and which is why it's really important for us to understand the root cause on what is motivating them. Again, it's a uh, uh, how, how do you, we are running a survey now to actually understand this particular uh, million dollar question. <laughs> so uh, trying to understand the motivation and then, uh, the, then, then we can develop and design programs that would fit with the narrative of why they choose STEM. So I think that's like one of the, uh, try to understand that first, why they do that. And then we can build programs from there. On. Excellent. I think in primary schools, um, kids and teachers should both have training on gender equality mm -hmm. because I think the biases kick in very, very early. Um, so one example was I read in the book uh, Invisible Women that girls at five years old, when they were asked, only the smartest kids in the class can participate in this activity. Five-year-old girls have no problem volunteering, signing up for it. But as six-year-old, mysteriously, they just rule themselves out. All of a sudden, they feel like I'm not the smartest kid in the room anymore. Um, so I think really injecting gender equality from a very early age is important. And also in the household, uh, mimic what you want the society to be. And having dads realize that they need to take on more unpaid labor um, and really take an equal share of work um, in the domestic um, life, um, I think would be very helpful. Right. Thank you very much. I, Uma? No, I think they covered it well. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, thank you very much uh, for your contribution.
Unfortunately for the audience, uh, we don't have time for another question. But I just want to thank you for your overwhelming response. I, I see so many questions down here. Um, we we'll, we'll hope, we'll hope to answer it and in another occasion, another time. Right. So we have um, heard about um, you know, how we have the, the vision for women in tech in 2025, in five years' time. Uh, some of the challenges that we are facing right now to have better women representation in tech, as well as our personal commitment and our organization's commitment to make it a better place for women in tech. So I just want to thank our panelists, Serene, Uma, and Pocket, for your active contribution. And definitely together, I'm very certain that we will, through our support for women in tech, be able to create a diverse, inclusive environment where all women can feel that they belong to any organization they work for. Thank you very much for your time and catch you again. Thank you. Thank Bye you. now. Thanks everyone for watching. Thank you, Frank, Pocket, Prof. Syrian and Uma. And congratulations once again to all three ladies.